Good morning. Today, I'd like to talk some more about these Christoffel symbols. In particular, I want to think about one forms and their covariant derivatives. The way that we figured out some things previously was that we looked as vectors, not in terms of their components only, but in terms of their components and the corresponding basis vectors. We did some calculations and we made up an abbreviation for some coefficients, which we then called the Christoffel symbols. However, we know very little about those gamma mu alpha beta quantities, except in the special case of polar coordinates, where we used our knowledge of basis vectors and components to figure them out. By way of analogy, if I have a one form, p tilde, and I want to look at its partial derivative with respect to x beta, I can do exactly the same kind of calculation that we did before, including both the dependence on the components of the one form and how the basis one forms depend on position. The one forms, though, form a vector space the omega tilde quantities form a basis for that space. So in exactly the same way as we did for partial derivatives of basis vectors, I can write the partial derivative of a basis one form to be some linear combination of basis one forms. I'll call the coefficients delta, alpha, kappa, beta, in analogy to the Christoffel symbols. At this point, we know practically nothing about those deltas. We could, if we wanted to, use the same method as before to figure them out in polar, but instead of doing that, I'm going to make another relationship. So file this equality back in the back of your mind for a moment. If I had a scalar, p alpha, v alpha, that's a number associated with a given location. It doesn't depend on coordinates or basis vectors or any such thing. The covariant derivative of p alpha, v alpha, would have to be the same as the ordinary partial derivative both the ordinary partial derivative and the covariant derivative obey product rules. We have already, though, figured out how to do covariant derivatives of vectors, so the v alpha semicolon beta is already known to us. This term and that term cancel each other out. I'll subtract this last term from both sides. Doing so, and relabeling some indexes, we find out that p kappa semicolon beta v kappa is p kappa comma beta v kappa minus p alpha gamma alpha kappa beta v kappa. Now, we've made a certain argument quite a few times by now, so I'm going to omit the argument. I do wish to emphasize here, though, I am not just dividing the v kappa out. If you compare the result with what we had previously figured out, I have comparing this result with a rewritten version of what we had before, we see that p kappa semicolon beta should be p kappa comma beta plus delta alpha kappa beta p alpha all times omega tilde kappa and then summed. But what we've figured out from the product rule is that that coefficient should be p kappa beta, which is the same, p alpha, which is the same, and we conclude that delta alpha kappa beta is just the negative of the Christoffel symbol with the same indexes. In these calculations, 
the quantities that we're interested in, whether they be vectors or one forms, are the sum of components times basis elements. I want to think of this same situation except for a 0, 2 tensor. Right now, I'm thinking of omega tilde alpha and omega tilde beta as being functions. These are functions that you plug vectors into, pairs of vectors, to get a scalar. I'm going to define the outer product of these two things to be a function that accepts a pair of vectors for an answer and basically carves the pair of vectors up into individual vectors. We're going to define this function in the following way. To evaluate omega tilde alpha outer product omega tilde beta on the pair of vectors u and v, I'll calculate the first of the one forms evaluated at the first of the vectors multiplied by the second of the one forms times the second of the two vectors. This results in a number. It's a scalar. It's not very difficult to see that such a thing is a linear function, both in the u slot and the v slot, which means this outer product function is a tensor. Since it takes two vectors, no one forms produces a scalar and is multilinear. This thing is a zero two tensor. Of course, that second index could have been a beta there. It's worth mentioning that omega tilde alpha evaluated at vector u is component number alpha of vector u, and omega tilde beta evaluated at v is component number beta of v. I want to think about the action of a 0, 2 tensor on the pair of vectors u and v. h u comma v is we do the usual representation, and remembering that h is a tensor, so that it's bilinear here, h alpha beta, as usual, will be the h tensor when I figure basis elements e alpha and e beta into it. u alpha, though, is omega tilde alpha evaluated at u, and v beta is omega tilde beta evaluated at v. So I could write h evaluated at u and v in this format, no matter what 0, 2 tensor we're looking at. If I wanted to be a little bit more emphatic about the fact that these are functions, I could write h and then not write the names of the inputs in, equals h alpha beta, the outer product of the one forms, and then the places where I would write in the names of the inputs. If I wanted to be even more terse about it, I could say tensor h is a contraction over alpha and beta of whatever the components of tensor h are with omega tilde alpha outer product omega tilde beta. This tells me that every 0, 2 tensor can be written as a sum of products of things that look like this times numbers. The collection of all omega tilde alpha outer product omega tilde beta forms a basis for the collection of all 0, 2 tensors. In a way that's similar to what we did with vectors and one forms, I'd like to figure out the partial derivative of tensor h with respect to x number beta. h contains both the basis and the components of tensor h after I figure the derivative out, 
I need to evaluate it someplace at u comma v. It's fairly easy to show that this outer product obeys the usual kind of product rule, so I'll leave that as an exercise for the interested. I need to figure out the partial derivatives of various basis 1 forms with respect to x beta, write in the results, and then evaluate everything at u comma v. The result is a little bit complicated looking because the indexes on the u component and v component differ as you go from one place to another. Here I have indexes mu and nu. Here I have indexes kappa and nu. And here I have indexes mu and kappa. Doing a little bit of rearranging and re-indexing, we find out that the partial derivative of h, the tensor h, components and basis elements, with respect to x number beta, evaluated at the pair of vectors u and v, is this quantity, u mu v nu, summing over mu and nu, so we'll call these numbers on the inside by the symbol h mu nu semicolon beta. We'll say that these are the components of the covariant derivative of h. And then to evaluate that, I have to put in the component of mu and the component of nu. Using the same idea as before, though, u component mu is omega tilde mu evaluated at u, and likewise for v. So if I wanted to, I could write my result in this format. If I wanted to make it look even more obscure and emphasize that these are functions that we're talking about, I could write it in the following way. Since these outer products are 0, 2 tensors, and these are numbers, I'm taking a linear combination of the basis elements for the vector space of all 0, 2 tensors here. That guarantees me that partial of h with respect to x number beta is a 0, 2 tensor for each individual choice of beta. If h were an ordinary calculus 1 type function, which it isn't, then partial of h with respect to the various coordinates would give you the components of what we used to call the gradient vector, which we always symbolized with an upside-down triangle and then the name of the thing we're talking about. For that reason, people will sometimes think of this quantity, partial of h with respect to x number beta, as being part of something called the gradient. This notation is not universally used, so be aware of that. In third semester calculus, you learned the chain rule. If I put a tangent vector into this equation and sum over beta, I find out the total rate of change of h with respect to whatever the parameter is. More generally, I could think of giving you a vector u and putting it into this expression. This quantity would be the sum of the components of u multiplied by the corresponding partial derivatives of h this would be a sum of quantities that are the same type as partial of h with respect to x beta. But partial of x with respect to x beta is a tensor. In our work that we've been looking at, generally speaking, it's a 0, 2 tensor. But more generally, it could be an m, n tensor.
it should be fairly obvious that this expression is linear with respect to u. Each one of the partial of h with respect to x betas is a tensor, so it's multilinear. Here, I have to feed a vector in to partial of h with respect to x beta to get one of these m n tensors. Then, to get a scalar out of that, I would have to supply n more vectors and m one forms. That means that the covariant derivative of an m n tensor is an m n plus one tensor. I want to derive a useful fact now. Suppose that you have a tensor H, specifically a 0, 2 tensor, and in some coordinate system or the other, the components of that tensor are always 0 at each point of your space. Then if you change coordinate systems in the usual way, since all of these numbers are zero, h mu bar nu bar is always zero at every point of the space as well. You can make a similar argument to this for tensors of any type. If I look at the components of the metric tensor in terms of Cartesian coordinates, those are all constants. Notice I didn't say g here because I'm actually listing all of the components now. Since the components of the metric in Cartesian are always constant, that means that the partial derivative of any g mu nu with respect to any x rho must always be zero. Now, we have seen previously that when you take an ordinary partial derivative of a tensor vector one form type quantity, the result typically is not a tensor. So this doesn't say on the face of it that the components of some zero three tensor are always zero. On the other hand, if I'm using Cartesian coordinates, all the Christoffel symbols are zero. That means when you write out the covariant derivative components, g mu nu semicolon rho, because all the Christoffel symbols are zero, since we're doing Cartesian coordinates, that means the covariant derivative components, g mu nu semicolon rho must also always be zero in Cartesian coordinates. But the g mu nu semicolon rho are the components of a zero three tensor if they are always zero at every point of the space in terms of one coordinate system, then they are always zero at every point of the space no matter what coordinate system you're using. This is a tensor equation. It's true in one coordinate system. It's true in all coordinate systems. This is going to be what lets us get away from leaning on Cartesian coordinates. In the next video, we're going to figure out how to get the Christoffel symbols in terms of the components of the metric tensor. Having done so, we no longer need the Cartesian coordinate system. Until then, I hope everybody has a good day, and I'll talk to you again soon.